Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from the book of Hebrews. It's in the end of the New Testament, toward the end of the New Testament, chapter 11, and I'm going to start reading at verse 23, and this is what it says. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Pray with me. Lord, this day is your day. May we never, ever take it for granted, but use your presence among us as something that might bring new life starting now. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you've been an Atlanta Braves fan for a while, you know the name Brett Butler. Brett Butler was, um, years ago, showed great promise in the Braves system. He came up through the, the minor leagues, and, and the Braves did what they often did during those days. Whenever somebody showed great promise, he was traded to another team where he became a superstar. And that's usually what the Braves did when somebody showed great promise. But he wasn't always one that he looked like a superstar, not by a long shot. Brett Butler was 5'9 and weighed 156 pounds. When he graduated from high school, there wasn't a Division I college that offered him a scholarship. He went to a small school, an NAIA school. There he twice became college All-American in baseball and the, in the small schools. But when he graduated from college, his coach told him that he was too small to play pro ball. Well, he went for it anyway. He was drafted in the 23rd round. Now, if someone's drafted in the 23rd round, they'll be lucky to play one year of big league baseball. But Brett Butler didn't just play one year in the majors. He played 16 years in the majors, and 12 of those years, he stole over 30 bases. Well, it's a milestone to steal 20 bases in a year, but he stole over 30 bases for 12 seasons. Many people would consider him the best leadoff batter ever in baseball, best bunter ever in baseball, but he was an underdog. He was an underdog. That wasn't what anybody expected. And whenever Brett Butler tells his underdog story of making the big leagues, he uses words like commitment, words like passion, words like tenacity, and words like, well, like mom and dad. That they're, they were the ones that were behind him saying, you can do it, giving him encouragement all along the way. I love those underdog stories. And my hunch is you love them too. Back during Jesus' day, they told underdog stories. Well, they weren't Brett Butler stories. They were Moses' stories. It was Moses who was 
Well, Moses was born a slave, and you don't get much more underdog than that. He was born a slave at a time when Pharaoh had sent out an edict to all of the midwives saying that they were to kill the boy babies as soon as they were born. Well, the Bible tells us that the midwives were more afraid of God than they were of Pharaoh, so they didn't do it. Well, Moses, uh, Pharaoh called all the midwives to himself and, and said, well, why are there so many boy babies? And the midwives said, well, these Hebrew women, they're just so strong. They have the baby before we get there. So Pharaoh sent out a second edict. The second edict said that all the boy babies that were born in Egypt were to be thrown into the Nile River. Well, it was Moses' parents, his mother, Jochebed, who refused to obey the edict. That what, that's what it tells us this morning. That it was, it was Moses' mother that made for him a, a, a basket and covered it with tar. And she kept him there at the, the Nile River in hopes that when Pharaoh's daughter came down to take a bath, that she would see Moses and, and take Moses as her own child. And the way the plan went, when she needed a nurse, that, that it would be Jochebed, Moses' real mother, would secretly be the nurse that was to help Moses and to help him grow up and risk of her own life. Well, that's the way it went. So it tells us this morning in Hebrews that when Moses grew to be an adult, he had two mothers. Pharaoh's daughter, who had given him power, had given him a palace, given him prestige, but that's not the mother that Moses chose. That Moses chose the mother that gave him the things that matter most. The things that matter most. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. The things that matter most. And the first thing that I want to talk about of the things that, that Jochebed gave Moses, the things that matter most is time. Time. Philip Zimbardo, in his book Time Paradox, says that the most used noun in the English language is the word time. And words that are associated with, with time. Well, we use language to express those things that we value most. So I began to look through the, the Bible. And the word time is in every single book of the Bible. It's because time is among those things that we value most. Sometimes people say, well, no money. People, you know, that's often put as the, the highest value, of, you know, especially when somebody's talking about others. But no, people will pay great sums of money in order to, to pay someone to take care of their yard, to take care of their house, to help them with their family in order to, what, save time. People pay money for a peach pass. To drive in that, that special lane, not just because they like the special lane, but in order to save time. To get home quicker. To get to work quicker. We call it fast food, not because it's delicious. We call it fast food because it's fast. It saves time. Certainly not because it's healthy. It's because it saves time. The case could be made. Easily, I think, that, that time, time is what we value most. And most often, that if someone's to experience love, it's going to be through the gift of time. And that was the gift. That was the gift that, that Jochebed gave Moses. She gave her time, her life to him to help, to, to help raise him. Time. Time. Diane Loomis and her, her wrote a little poem called Full of Steam Ahead. In this little poem, she said, If I had my child to raise all over again, I'd, paint, I'd finger paint more and point the finger less. I'd do less correcting and more connecting. I'd take my eyes off my watch and watch with my eyes. I would care to know less and know to care more. I'd take more hikes and fly more kites. 
I'd stop playing serious and seriously play. I'd run through more fields and gaze at more stars. I'd do more hugging and less tugging. I would be firm less often and affirm much more. I'd build self-esteem first and the house later. I'd teach less about the love of power and more about the power of love. The power of love is most often expressed through time, and it's most often experienced through time as well. Whether it's time to a child or a grandchild, time to a husband or a wife, or time to God. This pandemic, it's been, it's been difficult in a lot of ways. But one of the things that it's, it's caused all of us to do is to take inventory of our time and the way that we, we spend time, the way that we value time. And as we're coming out of this pandemic, let's don't lose that gift of reevaluating where we put our time, where we place our time. Let's don't get, get caught up in, in giving our time to first thing first first come first serve because our time will be taken and taken from us with with noise and busyness and hurry it's a gift it's a gift the gift of time may we offer it to those that we value most the child the grandchild, the husband, the wife. May we offer that time to God in these days to come. It's among the things that, that matter most. Time. But the second thing that I want to talk about is, is Jochebed gave Moses sacrificial love. It's among the things that, that matter most. This year, we, Georgia lost one of the the most dearly loved and respected citizens, Hank Aaron, died this year. And folks don't have to be baseball fans at all to know that Hank Aaron broke Babe Ruth's home run record. Babe Ruth's record held for 40 years. That's a long time for any record to hold. And in 1973, it was a tumultuous time. And it looked like 73 was going to be the year that that Hank Aaron was going to break Babe Ruth's record. That year, Hank Aaron received nine, over 930,000 pieces of mail. And most of that mail was positive. But about 100,000 of those pieces of mail, well, it was hate mail. And of that 100,000 pieces of hate mail, there was a portion of it contained death threats for Hank Aaron and for his family. There were some people that it didn't want an African-American man to, to break Babe Ruth's record. And so people kind of held their breath with, with every home run. And, and all the way to the end of the 1973 season, they thought that he was going to break his home run record, but that's not what happened. He tied Babe Ruth's home run record in 1973. It wasn't until opening day of 1974 that Hank Aaron broke Babe Ruth's record. And I don't know if you remember or if you've seen video of it. Two young men jumped the, the fence and ran onto the field. Well, everybody held their breath to see what would happen. And, and they began to, to run the bases with, with Hank Aaron after his home run and pat him on the back. Well, that was shortly before security tackled them and hauled them off to jail. And Hank Aaron ran the second, third base and came home. The, the whole of the Braves dug out, un, unloaded and crowded around the home plate as Hank Aaron crossed home plate. The hole of the dugout plus one. Hank Aaron's mother was there. She tugged at his arm and Hank Aaron looked down at his mother and said, Mama, what are you doing here? She said, Baby, if they're going to get you, they got to get me first. <laughs> That's sacrificial love. A love that doesn't do what's easiest. A love that doesn't do what's most convenient. A love that does do what's best for the other. A love that does do what's best for the other. And that's the love that, that Jochebed had for Moses. A love that, that gave 
her life. Her life. Well, that's the love that Jesus has for you and for me. It's among the things that matter most. It was there on the cross that Jesus didn't do what was easiest. He didn't do what's most convenient. He did exactly what you and I needed. He took all those things that would destroy us. He took the fear. He took the sin. He took the shame. And he took it on himself and he he nailed it to the cross to take away its power once and for all. And when he rose from the grave, he gave that power to you and to me. Because that's our greatest need. That's our greatest need. Power. Power, a a new creation alive in us. The risen Christ alive in us starting this day and going on for eternity. It's sacrificial love. It's among the things that, that matter most. And that's what Jesus gave to you and to me. Well, the things that matter most, yes, sacrificial love. Yes, time. And the third thing that I want to talk about this morning, Jochebed, Moses' mother, gave him a heart for God. Gave him a heart for God. Walter Rangren talks about a time in his life, he was a small boy, that he called a, a crisis of faith. He was certain that everyone in his church could see Jesus, but he couldn't. Well, As a little boy, he crawled up in the pulpit after church to look and see if Jesus was there. Well, no, Jesus wasn't there. During the week, he was with his mother walking down the hall in the church, and he stuck his head in the pastor's office, and, well, Jesus wasn't there either. Stuck his head in the Sunday school room, and, no, Jesus wasn't there. One service, he was sitting with his mother during church, and they were serving communion. So he turned to his mom and said, Mama, can I go to the restroom? She said, Yes, but hurry. Well, he went to the restroom, but not to the boys' room. He went to the ladies' room. That was the one place that he didn't check to see if Jesus was there. Well, he stuck his his head in the, the ladies' room, and no, Jesus wasn't there. When he came back, he looked at his mother's face, and there he saw an expression of joy and peace. She had taken communion that day. And when he sat down next to her, he said, Mama, what is it? She said, shh, Walter. He said, he got close, and that's when he smelled a different smell on her breath and said, Mama, what is it? That's when she realized what he was asking. She said, well, Walter, that's Jesus in me. Well, for most of us, that's the first place we ever see Jesus, inside Mama or inside Dad. Or inside a grandmother or grandfather. For almost all of us, that's the first place that we learn that we we matter to God because we see. We see God in the life of another. Every time I do a baptism, I talk about faith. that, That faith is most often more caught than it is taught. Now, I always do my best to to teach to teach the, the, the one fact of Christianity, that it's Jesus rose from the grave, to teach the, the one doctrine of the Christian faith, that, that, that redemption for you and for me is what Jesus did on the cross. But if people are to have faith, they're going to catch it. They're going to catch it. Inside of people, people just like you, they're going to catch it. I remember when I was a child, I was about five or six years old, and the woman that, that volunteered to teach the, the children's choir was Miss Tumlin. And there was a large group of boys in that children's choir. I know five-year-olds must not have been the easiest thing in the world, but she taught the children's choir in a large church and and from the time I was five years old all the way through school and all the way into adulthood every time I saw Miss Tumlin she'd say I pray for you and you know what I know she did I know she did Mr. Wilson he was one of the ushers he was older than my father and every time he saw me 
he would bend down, even as a little boy, and he'd say, hi there, boy, shake hands with an honest man. And I would just giggle and laugh, and he taught me how to shake hands. He taught me how to shake hands. People like Ms. Brownlow, people like the Englands, who volunteered, <laughs> volunteered to help lead the, the middle school youth. People like Mr. Dosser. He insisted we call him G-Daddy for granddaddy. <laughs> he was there every Tuesday cooking breakfast for high school kids before we had Tuesday morning devotion and went off to school. Well, faith, faith, it's, it's caught. It's caught in the hearts and lives of, of people around us, letting them know that they, they matter to God and that they matter to us. This morning, I want to give an invitation, a challenge, that, that during this week, that you have one name that comes to mind, one name. And it's not a name that, that comes and goes, but it's one name. You might want to write this name down, the name of a child, or maybe a, a grandchild, or maybe a child of God. But that you pray and you spend time, time in prayer for that child or that grandchild or that, that child of God. That they know through your life that they, they matter to God and that they matter to you. Might be a child in your neighborhood. You know, we live in a world that... There's a lot to complain about. You really don't have to, to try. It comes pretty natural for all of us. But if this world is to be changed, it's going to be one life at a time through people like, well, like you and like me that invest their lives in the things that matter most. Time. Sacrificial love. Jesus gave for you and me that have a heart for God. Join with me in prayer. Let's pray. George, Jesus, grant us this day, this day, starting right now, here in this prayer, to set aside a time, a time every day that someone a child, a grandchild, a child of God, come to mind. And this week, we set aside just that time to, to pray that they might know that they matter to God and that they matter to us. And that we find a way to reach out through our time, through sacrificial love, through a heart for you, that one by one, we use our lives to be the new creation, your new creation breathed into this world and, and that one by one, this world began to, to change for you. Hope has a name. That name is Jesus. And this day we come to give you thanks. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a 
place of community and faith and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online, my hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life. And my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us.